Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for still being here. My name is Camila Mulia. I'm a Jakarta-based supporter for the Street Asia. And I'm very excited and honored to moderate this discussion on electric vehicles with a group of experts. Here we have Pak Rahmat Kaimudin, Deputy Minister of Coordinating Ministry for Maritime Affairs and Investment. Pak Rahmat joined the ministry last year, and he responsible for policies relating to infrastructure and uh, transportation. Next to him is Irwan Cahaya, CEO and founder from Swap Energy. Swap Energy is a startup that built um, battery swapping solutions across Indonesia. Uh, established in 2019, uh, two years later, Swap Energy launched its first motorcycle brand called Smooth. And next to him is Purbaya Pancha, Director and Chief Investment Officer at Indica Energy, as well as President Director of Electra Motor Group, it, which is a joint venture between Indica Energy, Alpha, JWC, and Horizons Ventures. Uh, not long after its establishment, IMG launched a uh, first motorcycle brand called Alpha One. Next to uh, Purbaya is Patrick Adiat Maja, Managing Director of Electrum. Electrum is a joint venture between GoTo and TBS Energi Utama. Electrum has been conducting a commercial pilot program together with Gojek, Pertamina, PLN, The Seeds, and Gogoro since last year. And finally, we have Nirmal Rajaram, partner at Regal Capital. Regal Capital is a venture capital firm investing in impact-focused startups across Asia, including electric vehicles. So, we all know that Indonesia has an ambitious goal to become EV global hub, which is supported by the fact that we are the largest producer of nickel, which is the key component of EV batteries. And over the past few years, the government has been introducing um, several policies and incentives in order to lure investments and to start develop the local EV supply chain ecosystem. As a result, we have attracted billion dollars of commitment from global investors. And uh, Indonesian conglomerates, including energy companies and tech giants, are also tapping into this sector. So in short, it's a very promising sector, but of course there are various challenges that we need to tackle before we being able to address, uh, to reach the target. So um, my first question is for Pak Rahmat, as a policy maker, Pak. How much a shift in mindset that do you think needs to take place in order to drive EV transition and what policies that could, can support that? Thank you, Mbak um, Kamila. So, <clears throat> basically, I think uh, there, there's quite significant change of mindset, I think it requires, yeah. Because this is relatively new technology uh, and people need to change. But we actually have a very strong reason to do that. So, for example, in Indonesia, we know that we subsidize energy like, you know and you know the energy volatility pri uh, the price of energy has been very volatile the past year or so making a government budget was stretched and we have to increase the the price inflation blah 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 right so there is an urgency for us to move from fossil fuel in transportation to something that actually we can generate locally because we also import a lot of fuel. The second thing is, we know that if you burn carbon, it creates carbon dioxide. And if you create carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere, it will create you know, greenhouse gas, emission, blah, 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 right? And we actually has come, we are one of the countries that sign Paris agreements. So we have our, uh, NDC, nationally determined contribution, we, have, we want to reduce our emission. So there is a North Star there. <clears throat> we need to reduce emission, we need to reduce our uh, dependence into fossil fuel, and one of the key technology to do is actually uh, EV. Right? And we actually already have a lot of policies that support that. Uh, we already have created presidential decree number 55 three years ago. Of course, then, we need to keep continuing educating the market that that is the right thing to do. Uh, because combustion engine vehicles is, is the de facto, um, it's, it's ubiquitous, right? Everyone is using it, everyone used to it, and um, change is difficult. So, 
we need to push from both policy as well as market. Yeah, and that policies um, have attracted like billion of dollars commitment as mentioned. And speaking of investment, um, the government has been uh, has been working with uh, major global investors and also has been approaching Tesla for a while now. And according to the latest media report, very, very fresh, it says that we are uh, getting closer in uh, sealing the, the deal with Tesla. So can you tell us how, when will exactly we, we close that deal and how significant that the investment will be for the Indonesian EV industry? I'm, I'm not going to comment on a particular company, uh, but basically we know one of the problems in Indonesian EV adoption is lack of choice. For example, uh, you know, motorbike maybe more choices. Um, four wheelers right now, the the choices are very limited. They are very expensive. Uh, the one that's made in Indonesia, maybe only uh, three companies right now. You know, um, Korean, Chinese. Uh, so what we want to do is to attract companies, the global ones, the big ones that can create vehicles that is suitable for Indonesian mass market needs, both four-wheelers and two-wheelers. Whichever that company is, or companies are, right? So we, we are open. We are not uh, gonna uh, you know, say, oh, it has to be this or it has to be that. We know that this market is still developing. Of course, there are major companies that, are, that produce very good uh, EV and all the good ones, we want them to be in Indonesia. Ideally, the one that can produce and can, can support uh, you know, the price point, the kind of technology that we have. Maybe that's what I can say. So the talking is still ongoing, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Okay, still uh, related to investment, um, I want to talk, uh, I want to ask Pak Purbaya now. Um, besides Electra Water Group, Indica Energy also recently established another joint venture with Foxconn called Foxconn Indica Motor. So um, if you can tell us uh, how much investment do Indica and Foxconn allocate for this GV and how significant is this GV? Okay. Thank you. Uh, happy New Year to uh, all of you. Um, in terms of um, Indica's uh, aspirations to move into EV, uh, as some of you may be aware, is our aspirations to achieve a net zero emissions by 2050, and also to achieve a revenue balance of 50-50 between coal and non-coal by 2025. And we think uh, going into EV uh, will give us, uh, you know, those uh, boost in terms of revenue, um, not just until 2025, even more after 2025. Um, so, uh, in addition to the uh, electric two-wheelers, which um, Camille has already mentioned in terms of uh, where we are, in terms of uh, have, uh, having launched uh, the first product uh, back in August, uh, we too uh, see that uh, when it comes to four-wheelers, um, the commercial side of the uh, four-wheelers uh, is interesting to look at. And thus the um, uh, decision to actually work together with Foxconn on the 60-40 joint venture, Indica 60 uh, for the Foxconn, uh, to, to start looking into the electric uh, buses. Um, the, uh, it's a different approach uh, because uh, when it comes to two-wheelers, we had started with approach to look into the B2C market, uh, whereas I think when it comes to commercials, as we all know it, it's actually more of a B2B approach. So it's a bit of a different approach, but we feel these are the two segments that is interesting for us to look at, uh, especially when it comes to um, commercials, you know, uh, a lot of the companies in the last mile or mid mile uh, logistic companies, uh, we feel that the, uh, the 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 aspirations and the and economics actually may actually work when it comes to people moving from ICE to uh, EV. Uh, in terms of the amount, uh, we uh, have yet to actually release the amount, uh, Camille, but. 
the idea is to be able to uh, do all the manufacturings uh, out of Indonesia. I mean, that's the whole idea of actually bringing uh, the, the, the manufacturing productions here in Indonesia. Uh, so for the motorcycles, as you know, Alva already has a production line in Chikarang, which is already operational, right? Uh, but for uh, the uh, Foxconn JV, uh, it's still uh, in the works uh, today. When will the operation begin for Foxconn Indica? Um, we're still in the work in progress. The uh, JV itself was signed sometime uh, in the uh, third, fourth quarter last year. Uh, so we're still kind of work through the, uh, the business plan and all of that. So. Um, uh, not something that I would actually be able to comment in the sort of timing and everything else. But if it's up to me, sooner than later, you know? <laughs> so, um, Indica's core business is uh, coal mining production, right? So, um, how much a shift in Indica's business, both strategically and operationally, is taking place in line with uh, the move to EV adoption? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, our aspirations is to hit 50-50 uh, revenue balance between non-coal and coal. And we actually have started the diversification uh, initiative since uh, late 2017, early 2018. So that's what uh, we've been uh, trying uh, to do, uh, Camille. But in terms of business, uh, we ourselves is actually an investment holding company. Right, so uh, we uh, looked into a number of these companies that we set up with Foxconn uh, or the uh, Alva uh, as basically a way for us to be able to participate in all of these sectors uh, as sort of subsidiaries, uh, meaning that uh, the companies will stand alone and they will have their own management to, to actually run and, uh, and make it happen. So um, maybe sort of going back to uh, what uh, uh, Minister Sandy said earlier, you know, uh, that uh, I think first and foremost, when it comes to all of this business, execution is actually uh, something that uh, we all need to pay attention, and I could not agree more with what he said earlier today. Right, great, thanks. Now, uh, let's move on to uh, Pak Irwan. Uh, a few startups have emerged in the past few years uh, focusing in EV, including Swap Energy. And Swap already has more than 800 battery swapping stations across the country right now. It's very impressive. So in your view as a startup founder, what's needed to, uh, uh, what is needed for EV transition today and how do you find opportunity in this? Well, um, <clears throat> okay, we've been um, actually uh, more aggressive last year developing the um, swap stations. So we have uh, deployed over 800 uh, locations last year. And um, what we really uh, need for the market uh, to grow is, uh, I think um, we need the um, support from the industry, from the government too. So uh, the first thing is like, um, we have to know that uh, for the past 10 years, actually, there's already an uh, EV axis in Indonesia the, for uh, electric motorcycles. But they are mainly used for um, neighborhood uh, purpose, right? So, uh, so when I came to the industry, okay, I, I saw there's an opportunity. How do we want to replace the ICE motorcycle with EV? So I saw this. Uh, at the moment, okay, I saw the, the only solution for uh, EV motorcycle to replace ICE is uh, battery swapping. So uh, we, we did a lot of education to the market, to the riders. So uh, we tap in with one of the biggest ride hailing, Grab. Uh, I think we benefit a lot from uh, working with Grab. So uh, a lot of people is able to, they're able to see that EV is working fine. They are able to compete with um, ICE motorcycle, so we are happy about it. And then the second thing is that uh, we need a very strong support from the government. Okay, the policy that's uh, being uh, made is uh, we hope that it's uh, really pro to the EV. So, I mean, uh, some policies like let's say 
uh, besides the subsidy that's been uh, announced, I think uh, we hope that government uh, is there to help us to provide the location. Otherwise, uh, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, oh, I, what I believe, it shouldn't be a cost for all the entrepreneurs. Like now, I think one of the main cost of the developing swap stations, there are two. One is the location cost, like uh, cost of uh, location acquisition cost, and the other one is every time we want to build a swap station, that we need to invest quite a amount of uh, electricity, uh, new uh, new electricity. So we hope, yeah. So we hope that we can get the support from PLN. So hopefully, uh, because. By creating more, actually creating more shop stations, actually we are helping them to sell the electricity, right? So I think uh, we should, uh, I hope, okay, not we should, okay, we, we, I hope we can get the support from the PLN, maybe it can be subsidized or even free, right? So we, so in other ways, like we invest together, they invest on the new uh, network, for the electricity, we invest on the hardware and technology. But you already worked with PLN in setting up this uh, swap station, swap uh, uh, battery swapping stations, right? So what's the partnership like? Yeah, we are working with PLN. Still uh, uh, working with PLN, they, su they supply the electricity. Yeah, still we still have to pay. I mean, same thing, right? Okay, right. So more support is needed. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, still um, related to startup ecosystem. Uh, now, Nirmal, Regal Capital is focusing on sustainability and ESG. Right. How does electric vehicles um, fall under this category? And what kind of EV startups that you're looking for now? Uh, well. <laughs> ESG framework. Our ESG framework is actually embedded into our investment thesis. So we do not see ESG as uh, nice to have, right? And uh, the reason why uh, EV fits perfectly into that is because of the investment thesis. Uh, the core is everything to do with commerce and commerce enabling infrastructure. And decarbonization of this entire supply chain and logistics is something which we take very seriously. And whichever companies that we look at uh, would, would automatically fall into that category. For example, uh, we look into uh, uh, a four-wheeler uh, uh, EV company from India, uh, which is already catering to uh, Amazon. Uh, they are taking care of uh, close to about a million packages a month. Uh, so that's, that's one approach, right? We also look into companies uh, which uh, uh, focus on uh, providing rapid charging for three-wheelers, trucks, and above. When I say rapid charging, it's low-cost rapid charging, zero to 100% in 15 minutes or less, right? Um, so decarbonization of the entire commerce and commerce-enabling infrastructure is, is our prime focus at Regal. From uh, an investor perspective, how do you find the right balance between investment and returns on emerging sector like EV? Uh, like I said, uh, e as long as ESG is something which is embedded into your investment policy, you do not look that as a uh, add-on cost, right? Uh, there is uh, the only balance over here is that whenever you invest into a company, uh, what is the kind of impact that they have on not only on on the number of employment opportunities that the company creates, but also how do you run the business sustainability and at the same time profitability. Well, coming back to EV, that fits perfectly into that, where, where we uh, are, are developing you know, completely carbon neutral off-grid uh, battery swapping stations and battery charging network. So that's, that's one of the uh, uh, differenti uh, uh, differentiating factors that I would say. Um, and, and, and also, coming back to uh, um, the decarbonization, right? Building a green belt, that's w something which we, we believe uh, very strongly in. So now, um, I want to talk more about adoption. And this question is for uh, Patrick. Well, Patrick, um, 
how does Electrum benefit from TBS Energi Utama and GoTo's large ecosystem? How are you capitalized on this current environment and ecosystem? Thank you and good afternoon to all of you. Um, this is a joint venture between TBS, which is an, an integrated energy company, and GoTo through Gojek. And each party brings their own expertise to the table. TBS brings the operational experience and uh, uh, establishing greenfield energy project ground up. GoTo, Gojek comes with you know, the technology platform, their ecosystem, and, 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 and definitely the learning of the combination of which is beneficial for uh, Electrum. Um, we started the pilot project nine, ten months ago uh, through hundreds of uh, motorcycle that we sourced, that we bought from uh, Taiwan as well as uh, locally from Indonesia. Uh, already we have accumulated over 5.5 million kilometer uh, over that span of time, which translate to roughly about 450 ton of CO2 that is saved. These, actually these numbers gives us a lot of encouragement that the, the, the early hypothesis that we do is, is, is makes a lot of sense. And we learn a lot through this and we know from the beginning uh, we have to innovate. We have to innovate that we will be able to develop and uh, pioneer the EV, EV, two-wheel EV ecosystem in Indonesia. And, uh, you know, 5.5 million kilometer gives us a lot of insights. User behavior, driving pattern, which gives us a lot of uh, 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 foundation to develop our own uh, motorcycle. So how does the EV switch, because uh, Gojek also has um, plans to electrify in 2030, right? So how does EV switch uh, impact the um, income and productivity of driver partners? Well, not, not directly to, to, to that question, but uh, I, think, I think one of the interesting insights that we get from the Gojek drivers is that driving EV uh, makes them less tired at the end of the day because there's less vibration from the motorcycle, which contributed to the health and the, and the welfare of the driver of Gojek. So that is the, I should say that is a direct uh, impact uh, that we get from the, from the, as for the income of the driver, um, we tested a few pricing scenario during pilot project, right? And uh, from free to charging the drivers, uh, rental uh, uh, charge, to involving the consumer. So we charge the consumer so that they are involved, included in the managing or conserving the, 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 the emission um, from the vehicle that they, that they, that they uh, transport with. And so all of that really gives us a strong feeling that this is, this is, this is a very good uh, 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 feedback that we get. This is positive and you know, I think we're the on the right track to, to develop this further. Yeah. Wow, great to hear that. So back to Parahmat. Um, infrastructure is a, a vital aspect of EV ecosystem and it's probably also one of the biggest challenges today. So um, in 2025, we aim to have at least 6,000 charging stations across Indonesia. So uh, are we on track to reach that? And what has been the biggest challenge in developing infrastructure for EV? Yeah, um, of course, like, you know, as an ecosystem, infrastructure is one problem. Um, but at least from my side, there's multiple problems, and this is not the, the problem today, uh, or infrastructure. Uh, for me, at least uh, my personal opinion looking at this, it's like a chicken and egg uh, situation. Yeah? We can, for example, uh, mental exercise. Let's we build one million charging station in, in, in the whole Indonesia. Would the pickup gonna go up? much higher probably not I'll get, and we have a, we have done a pilot on that during G20 we built a lot of charging station across you know, 
then maybe you can test whether the pickup of you know EV sales in Bali will go up. Um, I believe the current problem is to create critical mass of the users. Yeah, we build that we need to build the critical mass. Hence, there's a lot of announcement about trying to push uh, to give incentive for the people uh, so that you know these early adopters can can be burdened less. Yeah? Uh, we do have uh, some infrastructure, maybe not directly like charging station. For example, I've been using EV for a year now, more than a year, and I charge at home, <laughs> and I charge in the office, not in the charging station. It's like, you know, just plug in. And we already have a lot of electricity in Indonesia. Building, uh, building infrastructure, yes, it's important, and but I do think that we can do it relatively quickly. I think that the biggest challenge now is to, to go to that adoption curve, build the critical mass, and then, uh, because today even the, the PLNs and maybe some of the colleagues here, they may be complaining because their utility, utilization rate of the, their charging station is not as good. <laughs> so, uh, Potentially, yeah. So right now, I think the first thing is like chicken and egg first. Which one? Yeah, we want to build the chicken first. Build the user base. All the while, we continue also pushing the infra uh, infrastructure. So build the demand first, right? Okay. So um, this question for both Pak Purbaya and Pak Irwan, uh, because you two are um, EV makers. What have what are the biggest considerations for consumers before they are purchasing EV? What um, are their biggest concerns? Maybe Pak Irwan first. Well, um, I mean, we have to understand that um, because I'm doing a two-wheelers uh, sector, so uh, we have to understand that most of the drivers for two-wheelers, their income is uh, middle to low. So I think one of the biggest concerns, one of the biggest things that will attract the consumer to switch to EV is, of course, the cost. Cost of acquisition, cost of uh, using the electric, uh, electric motorcycle itself. So this is the reason why we try to um, put our price, try to be, uh, be as affordable as possible. And then um, our energy consumption, I mean the energy cost for the riders is also, is also like almost half of the of a ice motorcycle so i think um, we have gained quite a good traction last year and we have uh, quite a big demand from the market so uh, we believe that um, cost will be the major uh, breakthrough right uh, i mean for the riders to consider to switch to ev and the other one is uh, how do we solve the biggest issue of the, like what I mentioned earlier, the biggest uh, pain point from the two years back uh, five years ago, like the range anxiety issue. Like we need to give confidence to the riders that it's okay to go out with EV, that you'll be able to come back, uh, you'll be able to reach your destination. So uh, yeah, like uh, we have uh, managed to sold like about 4,000 units last year. So uh, most of the drivers that uh, we, we see from the data that we gain that for each month they, uh, they're getting more and more confidence riding the EV every day. That for the same units of the motorcycle, they travel more and more kilometers every day. So it shows that there's an improvement, there's an improved uh, increase in the confidence of the riders. Uh, Prubaya, you want to add to that? Sure. Um, I agree with Pairuan, uh, right, that um, education, I think, is very important um, for people to get the buy-in to actually convert. And uh, I do think, though, that as more and more EVs are on the road, that in itself is actually an education in that, oh, yeah, actually we see more and more on the road, for example, right? So. I expect some sort of a snowballing effect uh, coming in uh, as more and more uh, motorcycles and cars actually on the road, right? Um, the, the lesson learned from us um, selling Alpha One is that um, people here actually are very, very passionate when it comes to two-wheelers, generally, 
um, and this is comparing it maybe in, in, in other countries which also has a lot of motorcycles. Uh, but people here doing their lunches, doing their family gatherings on weekends with families and all that, they talk a lot about automotives, the cars, motorcycles, and they would actually analyze it to death. Uh, and and with, with that, um, what we uh, tried to create in Alpha One is a product which uh, focuses uh, not just on the performance itself, but also the design of the motorcycles itself. So the, both the designs, the aesthetics, and the performance actually have to come together. Um, and I think uh, for all of us here um, doing electric uh, two-wheelers, uh, we do have the benefits of technologies uh, behind you know, what we're building as well. Something that maybe we could actually be doing something which is actually technology based for our customers uh, to make it uh, even uh, easier or make it even more of a lifestyle for our customers to use their bikes, right? So I think, for example, in, in our case, uh, Alpha One, we actually have an app, uh, an app that actually allows uh, customers to actually share their bikes wherever they are. So if I'm here, if I want to share my bikes, Without the keys, I can do so and then give it to whoever it is near my bike, for example. So these are sort of one of, the, the, one of those use cases which we think will actually sway people to actually use um, electric vehicles in general because uh, these are the stuff that actually make uh, people's life and also be able to provide solutions you know, um, beyond you know, what maybe traditionally has been done to date. Okay, so I'm gonna take one or two questions from the audience. We already have a few already. Um, first question is, do you think EV adoption will really help Indonesia hit emission targets or even solve congestion issues? Uh, maybe uh, Pat Patrick can address this since you mentioned about emission impact before. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the first question, do you think EV adoption will really help Indonesia hit emission target? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, I think we have today 130 million of a motorcycle. If every day each motorcycle uses one liter of gasoline, that's 130 million liter of gasoline a day. And that creates emission, right? And so if, you know, if 100 million uh, ice motorcycle converted into EV, definitely. That's only talking about two wheel. Not four, there are 15 million four wheel, five million uh, uh, commercial vehicle trucks, which produces a lot of emissions, right? And so, if this slowly but surely are converted into EV, definitely it 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 uh, you know uh, contributed to the to to a cleaner air. In, in Indonesia. Now, does it even solve congestion issue? Now, that, this is a totally different, <laughs> different topic, right? And so, if you, if you convert that 100 million motorcycle into uh, ICE motorcycle into 100 million uh, EV motorcycle without additional road infrastructure, then it, that, it, you know, I, I don't think it will help uh, solve the, the, the congestion issue. So the congestion issue is, is, is not about the EV, conversion to EV, it is about improvement of the road infrastructure uh, in Indonesia in general, especially in big cities. I think, I think that's, that's my response. Parah, what do you want to add? Yeah, thank you. Of course, besides emission, noise will also... <laughs> uh, on, on, the, on the emission side, let me just quickly uh, add what uh, Patrick said. So roughly the calculation that we have, one liter will generate about 2.3 kilograms of CO2. Uh, and typically a, a motorbike will normal usage, 300 liter per year. Cars is about 1,500. So you can calculate roughly what is the emission. And a lot of people has been saying like, okay, it's actually useless if your electricity actually come from coal fire. There's a lot of these uh, things people say. Yeah? So roughly, one liter, uh, will, you'll, you'll travel a certain distance. And uh, 
for to, to reach the same distance, typically you need about 1.2 to 1.4 kilowatt hour. So that is the, the calculation typically that we've seen. And one, even if it's full coal-fired power plant, yeah, one kilowatt hour is uh, one kilowatt hour is one kilogram of emission of CO2. So even if 100% coal-fired, you still save about 1.1 to 1.9 uh, kilogram per liter. So this is actually very very important thing. And obviously, you if you do a uh, big power plant. The engine, the machine, the turbine will be more efficient than a small uh, combustion engine, right? Uh, and it's easier to carbon capture the emission from pow big power plant versus trying to capture it from 130 million motorbikes. So I think in terms of emission, this is a very clear case uh, from our side. Okay. Right. Next question is very interesting. Uh, for all panelists, feel free to weigh in. How will government policies and incentives uh, solve the issue of EV and of life disposal, particularly batteries? I think there have been uh, debate and discussions around this. So how will exactly the stakeholders prepare to address this issue? Farhan, do you want to go first? Uh, probably let me, uh, that's a very interesting question actually. Uh, I personally, this is my personal opinion, I believe that uh, any business should survive with least amount of incentives if it has to be a sustainable one in the long run. I know what I said is going to be music to your ears, but, but uh, having said that, uh, it, everything goes through an evolution, right? So initially, there might be some incentives and subsidies required downstream in order to encourage the end customer to come to the table and st start trying it out. There's, again, like uh, uh, earlier, the Honorable Deputy Minister said, it's, it's a chicken or egg story, right? Whether you uh, keep the price high and still make it uh, not so affordable for them or try and incentivize them to come and try it out once they fall in love with that and over a period of time you, you stabilize that. Um, providing uh, tax holidays and uh, upstream, I, I don't think that would be of, of uh, long-term uh, benefit, but uh, I, I, th I think more, more incentives should be focused uh, at least for the midterm to short-term level and the downstream. Um, and, and how would, uh, for the investment criteria, I think we, let's focus on numbers, right? That's 130 million motorbikes out there, but there's 5 million plus uh, commercial vehicles. But those 5 million commercial vehicles probably consume two to three times more fuel than the 130 million motorbikes. So there's a lot of easy win uh, for the entire uh, electric mobility uh, 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 industry as such. Focus on the cargo, which is easy win, uh, and then slowly in the process, because look at the most matured market in the, in the world is China, one third. Uh, the second most matured market, let's say, let's take US, it's 6%. I think Indonesia still has a very long way to go in this uh, electric uh, journey. The electrification rate, even if at 20%, for, I think all the entrepreneurs in this EV ecosystem have their homework cut out for the next 15 to 20 years at least. 20%, just 20% electrification of, uh, of, of whatever current volume that we have, right? Uh, having said that, uh, I, I think for, from an investment point of view for us, anything and everything to do with uh, 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 green mobility is, is a no-brainer, starting from battery packing to battery recycling and everything else in between. Obviously, we don't go into the mining because uh, that's, that's not uh, where we believe sustainability is, right? But um, whether solving the issue of EV, end of life disposal, I think it's too early to say. Everybody says that this, my battery is 5,000 discharge and, and so on and so forth, but I think it's too, too early to say. It's like the LED which came uh, 20 years back, everybody claiming a different number. I think only time can tell that. So that's, that's my take on what government policies and investment criteria should be. Anybody else want to add to that? Okay, right. Yeah. Let me um, address the issue of uh, battery disposal. 
I think through battery swapping, uh, we solve one of the biggest issue of the battery uh, disposal is that we centralize all the battery waste. If it's a uh, home charging, then the all the battery waste will be dispersed everywhere, right? I mean, each home may, may have one or two. The cost of collecting the waste battery will be very costly. But if, since it's um, battery swapping, I mean, we operate the whole the whole system, the whole ecosystem. So uh, the battery waste become uh, centralized. And I think there's a thing that we, sh we must understand that all the production of the battery cells, that do, do you know that we can actually have an agreement with the battery manufacturers that they will collect back the battery at the end of the life? I mean, they will do the recycling. A lot of uh, battery companies actually are doing, proposing what they call uh, battery banking. I mean, they, they do the mining from the waste of the battery instead of uh, digging from the soil. Yeah. Very, very final question from me. So uh, Indonesia is set to become EV global hub. How many years will it take to go there? Farahmat, maybe more. <laughs> well, w one thing which I can definitely say is that uh, Indonesia is definitely bound to produce more, not one, not two, but many on masks um, from this part of the world, definitely. I think uh, it is inevitable, right? Uh, it is not a question of if, it's a question of when. Um, we need to educate the market. Uh, I think, as pa Purbaya mentioned, the more people see EV on the street, it in itself is a, is a, is a promotion to other people to adopt EV. Uh, the more benefit that people get from converting their ICE vehicle to EV, definitely, uh, at the end of the day, and, you know, people want to, uh, to, to, to be seen as a good citizens, uh, you know, uh, uh, contributing to the clearer air in Indonesia, not only Indonesia, but the whole world. That is the basic instinct of, of people. So we just need to facilitate that with good product, affordable and uh, long lasting. I think that's, that's my answer. Just, just shortly from me, um, I think Indonesia has everything. Uh, it's got the resources, it's got the people of hundreds of millions who will become consumers of EV. Uh, so it, it's happening, and as Patrick said, it's a one-way street, right? Um, so we're not turning back, so I think we're going that way. So how many years? <laughs> For us, sooner than later. <laughs> So add very briefly. Well, um, I don't know, but I've seen a very strong uh, traction from the market. So uh, we hope that this year, with the push uh, from the government policies, the subsidies will boost the EV demand. So I believe uh, when there's a huge demand for the first one or two years, and then the following year will be much easier. Final words. Yeah. So of course, we should never time the market. Yeah. But we in the government, uh, echoing everyone there, we already have everything, and uh, we have the market, we have the natural resources. <clears throat> and also, we have a strong automotive industry today. So if we were, we need to replace them. So we should not let this go. And that is what the, the, the government is trying to do. We'll do everything in our power to ensure that, you know, this industry is not going to go somewhere else. Uh, and actually stays in Indonesia and even uh, bigger and better moving forward. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for all the panelists for sharing their insights. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon.